Brian, when you were playing in UCD, you were traveling back to Tyrone, you were studying. I can't imagine veterinary is one of the easier courses when you're at third level. How did you manage all of that? It's not easy, but I suppose my life probably revolved around football and everything else took second place. So it was football first and then probably veterinary second. Jerry doesn't believe you. <laughs> well, I think in my time, when, uh, when I qualified in 92, when I was part of the Clare team, I guess I didn't, I didn't go near the Clare panel between Easter and, uh, and uh, after the final exams. And I, a few jogs around Herbert Park uh, was the sum total of my training. So it's quite a contrast to, to Brian's experience. Things changed, though, I think, in the 90s, didn't they? Like, you know, things got started to get, I mean, today, we'll talk about today shortly. Today is almost professional. It's pretty much professional for teams like Tyrone. Um, but things were starting to turn that way in the 90s, weren't they, Brian? Things were, towards the late 90s, the preparations were stepping up. You know, with, uh, whenever I started college in Dublin here, I didn't have to travel up the road during the week. From third year on, fourth year on, I was going up during the week on a Tuesday night for training and back down again. Um, now that's normal. But I think there was a few teams probably took it that level. Um, the teams like Dublin, I suppose, and Meath, Me them teams were preparing a lot better than the rest of us. And um, there was probably RMA that probably woke Throne up. Mm -hmm. um, Throne always knew they were there, thereabouts with RMA, but with RMA, won the Ireland in 2002. It was just with their level of preparation and their attention to detail that maybe we said to ourselves, we're not that far away here if we knuckle down and do things properly instead of enjoying ourselves a bit too much. If you're saying that the dubs were training harder than everyone else in the late 90s and early 90s, they don't have a whole pile to show for it. <laughs> I think Dublin bit through in the Ireland final around that time in the middle of the 90s, sorry, but no, it was, um, it was definitely things were starting to ratchet up. And yeah, but after 95. That wasn't yeah. a problem because that's what you enjoyed doing. And there was nothing you enjoyed more doing than training with a group of people that you're with. You know, it wasn't, people say it's a, what is it, a chore or whatever, or a sacrifice, but it, it is in a way, but it's what you want to do. Tell us, Ger, when you were in college and you were here uh, training hard, studying hard, playing hard, probably, yeah. there was a little bit more of that in those days, was there not? Sure, yeah, for sure. It was, it was very different than things you could get away with. Um, I, I remember, you know, we stayed in a, in Marlborough Road, three guys in in a single bedroom apartment in the our uh, house, and the uh, the upstairs, the landlady would call. The, the, that was the phone call. That was the contact for the Clare manager, John Mohan, at the time, and he'd call. And next thing you could hear her trampling along the floorboards and shouting down from the top door. Um, Jared, the there's a phone call here for you, and he's the most ignorant man I've ever met <laughs> in my life, because he was wondering why I wasn't, uh, you know, lining out in, in La Hinch for those torturous training sessions in, on the beach. But I suppose John Mohan, back at the time, you know, obviously, it was the start of his, his notoriety and, and the link that he had with, with us. And uh, I remember he was the, you know, he was the, I think he was the first probably manager that ever togged out on the sideline of an Ireland semi-final, you know, um, himself. But... It was it was very different then, and we had you know it was we had great times you know. Was he ahead of his time? So oh, I think I think he was his dedication because he 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 did a lot of the training himself, and um, he you know he he'd come up beside he had multiple knee operations himself and he'd limp up behind you in a long run, you know and he's tongue out the side like a like a dermatelio the horse with a, you know that needed a soft pallet job or something but he he really um, he was he wouldn't ask you to do anything that he couldn't do himself and and uh, he did all the training sessions and. You know, obviously an inspiration, you know. Was it 92 you beat Kerry? 92 we beat uh, Kerry uh, in, uh, um, yeah, I suppose we had a small group of people who, I suppose we, we, we had trained hard, I suppose with, with Mohan's techniques and on the beach and all that kind of stuff, I suppose we were probably one of the first of those, you know, that those um, Duracell kind of heavy training sessions and, uh, you know, he'd put us through it, but he had built a great spirit, you know, and... Um, I suppose it was a surprise to most, but and it's easy for us to say no, but it wasn't really a surprise, I suppose, for, for the people directly involved. We, we fancied it, and, uh, you know, we had, we, had great, we had great times. I remember I started veterinary. Um, my first day at work was the morning after the Munster final in oh, 1992. Geez. Ideal. And we got home at, as they say, <laughs> now it's stupid o'clock at whatever from 
the West County Hotel and we had to be a, a Department of Agriculture supervised for the first TB test. And I remember at the, at the end of the week, I had unfortunately decided that the testing was listed for, the, uh, for a hotbed of TB. And uh, at the end, on, come Saturday evening, um, I think six of the eight herds that I had tested um, had gone down with TB. And uh, such was my, my notoriety for, for this, that the following week you had to, be, um, you had to ad, ad, notify the farmer the previous week where you were going to be testing the following week. So this old boy and he had taken great exception to my, my uh, newfound fame. And uh, so he phoned up the office and he said, uh, could you please tell your man Kelly to stick to the football and send out the boss to test the cattle. <laughs> Did your career suffer as a result of your football? <laughs> your fame, your newfound fame. Yeah, but that didn't, that, that's, uh, that didn't last. That didn't last yeah. They saw you coming after yeah. a bit of celebration. Is that what that's it was? It. Okay. Uh, we have some footballing greats on the table right in front of us. And lads, you're not to be shy now. Des, is there, there's no microphone there in front of you. It's table here. If you lob it down there, Rory. I mean, I'm very fortunate in that I, uh, I loved playing Gaelic football when I was here in UCD. Um, I was... Um, very lucky as well that we had a, maybe to say a few words about Eugene McGee, who was a great yes. manager and who died recently, uh, this year. And he was in charge of the Freshers, he was in charge of the UCD teams and whatever. And um, uh, just to tell you a story about that, I shared a flat with a guy called John Purdy, who could well be here tonight. He won uh, an All-Ireland Minor Medal with Down in, in uh, 66, and a senior in 67, National League in 67, and a cigarette. A Sigerson in 68, and just you know, a tremendous footballer, a real protege. But <laughs> he couldn't get out of bed in the mornings. <laughs> and Eugene McGee used to arrive at our digs out in Glenamina Park here, behind what used to be the Montrose Hotel. He would kick us up, the landlady would kick us out of bed, and we would go out, and Eugene McGee had this Vespa scooter, and the three of us would head off up to Belfield. <laughs> <laughs> so the training wasn't just quite the same high caliber as it was, as it was in those days. I might also just say, really, that Brian Duhur is quite amazing for him to say that, uh, that veterinary was second for him because I happened to be external examiner for three years, and Brian was, uh, was in the third year that I was external examiner, and I never heard the like of him. And there wasn't a question that we asked him, Michael, <laughs> that he just did not not only know the answer, but he knew it in depth. It was just almost phenomenal. So if, if veterinary was second to him, his, le his level of input into... Uh, Tyrone football must have been absolutely, absolutely amazing. So the other thing I might just say is, to finish off, because I said I wouldn't keep you long, is that I'm involved with a group in Northern Ireland of vets who are, who are, um, who are uh, they're called Vet Support NI, they're volunteers. And um, in my checkered career, I ended up being trained as a, as a, as a business coach and a psychotherapist. I helped train a group of 12 vets who are now volunteers and who are listening ears for their colleagues. And whenever we get, whenever somebody who's distressed comes on, the first thing we ask them is, is how much exercise are they doing? And if they're not doing any exercise, we really persuade them to do two and a half to three hours exercise a week. Because it de-arouses them emotionally, it raises their serotonin levels, the happiness hormones as high as most antidepressants. So the importance of sport, the importance of, of exercise for mental health is so hugely important. So I'm so delighted that, the, that, that, that this is being held here tonight, Michael. I think it's a wonderful thing, and I should encourage all students to get more involved in sport and, and, and the veterinary profession, because it is the single biggest thing that anybody can do to improve their mental health and well-being. So I just think it's absolutely brilliant. Here, here. Yeah. I think it's, uh, I think it's telling that Des chose to get up and speak about you know Brian Doerr, one of his own heroes you would have admired Brian playing football and just from speaking to people tonight before dinner I think it's a lovely thing to acknowledge your own and you know sometimes we forget to put our own people on a pedestal and we can do sports awards and we can do sporting events but actually to have a family from outside sport come together and recognize your sporting endeavors is very special and you'd be surprised it's quite rare so you know Fair play, Michael, and your team, and everybody here. I, I do think it's lovely. And for, for Dad, you've just pretty much summed up the message of the night, really, just that we're all here to acknowledge everybody's greatness. Um, Brian, were you aware, or are you aware, that you know, when you played football for so long and for, with such success, 
All Ireland's All Stars, Ulster titles, the whole lot. That you were a role model for for younger people mostly, but also for older generations. No, you don't probably realise the time you're you're living in a bubble. And I think anybody that tells you any difference probably lying. Um, you're just so focused on the next game or the next training session around the corner. And it is, whenever you sit back and look at it now, you realise them things and you realise how much it means to so many people and how much enjoyment they get out of it and how much enjoyment you bring to a lot of people. And probably now it's, you know, it's payback time. You're trying to get as many people involved and letting them experience, trying to put them in a place where they can experience some of what you did experience, you know. Because mm. um, like, I thoroughly enjoyed it from start to finish and still do. And That's what uh, I was going to ask you about enjoying it because sometimes sports, the way it's gone now, there's so much sports science and sports psychology and statistics and you know how many miles did your man run in a match. But we'll say between you will say oh, three or oh, five or oh, eight and the success that you had at All Ireland level, um, your team really seemed like you were really enjoying your football and enjoying the bond that you had in the dressing room. Uh, definitely, and I think that bond that we have is something that's definitely should never be understated. Uh, any team that is successful has a bond because you'll never be successful without a team because you're never going nowhere on your own. You know, we had a bond and probably it was highlighted there last year. We had a reunion. That was uh, last year, a 10 year reunion from 2008. And I walked into, there was a letter Kenny, I walked into a bar and it was as if you walked back into the changing room again. You know, you hadn't made seen a few people in six months or a year or two years, but the same banter was going on. It was just back to normal again, and it just showed the, the bonds that were there. And that's why we were successful. You know, you knew everybody was behind you, everybody was pulling the one way, and you could rely on everybody to deliver. And, you know, we had leaders, we had leaders everywhere. We're very lucky that way, and any successful team has. If you look at Dublin now, they have three or four, maybe five or, or even five or six, or maybe more real kingpins for them that, you know, they'll always settle things down and drive it on to another level each time. <coughs> it's so true, isn't it, around, you know, you talk about bonds and you talk about, you know, not seeing people for 10 years and coming back to the old stories and having that connection with people. But, Ger, when you're playing, and you're the same, I'd say, you know, the dressing room that you were in, it's almost like having an automatic family or an automatic few fellas that have your back. If you're going through a tough time or whatever, um, that dressing room must have been important to that clear team at the time as well. Oh yeah, for sure. And it's, it's, it's continued with people complain about the so many reunions of the Clare 92 football team. There's like 10 year reunions, 12 year reunions, 13 year reunions. And every, there's a WhatsApp group and they just... Uh, make something up, make something up, Yeah, they on. just want to get, you know, they want to get see you going to the golf in La Hinch or, you know, are you going to you know, the clear qualifier match or something like that. And, you know, it's just, it's just been, they're very, they're a great group really. And some of them, you know, just still think they're 21 or 22, particularly the way they act. Yeah. Do you go to the matches still? Did you go down oh, yeah. to Port Leash last week? Yeah, I was in Port Leash, yeah. yeah. I was in Port yeah. Leash, yeah. I thought they were brilliant. They were so fit. I yeah, was really, you know, sorry, Kevin, I actually thought they were going to take it. Um, but they seem to do, they do seem to have, like that now, leaders. Oh yeah, and a great manager and consistently over the last yeah. few years and they were very close this year and um, you know I was you know I, I still you know the passion still still burns and even though I live in Tipperary and, and probably a young fellas playing you know and at uh, underage level in Tipperary it's still clear as the, the spot for me. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. Frank O'Sullivan and Kevin Foley are here as well from Meath. Don't be shy lads. Frank, your lads haven't They've kind of chosen one sport each. Is that what happened in your house? Yeah, we, we've got in our house a, a hurler for me, the footballer, and then Huey plays uh, with Leinster this year. So we've lovely variety in our in our game. But I, I one complaint against Kevin actually. Oh no, make it two. Uh, well, one complaint <laughs> that both Kevin and I, when we qualified, were working in uh, from Oi. So. Um, and Sean Boylan was the manager, but I knew things weren't going well for me when the helicopter called for Kevin, <laughs> courtesy of Keepak, and I had to get the bus up for training. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's great to get that out in the public. And, and actually, you talk about uh, external examiners. I think for me, Sean Boylan was the greatest person that taught me about uh, herd health, he, he, because I was part of his first big call. Uh, <laughs> 
So with that, I'll hand you, I'll hand you over to Kevin. Kevin, you're going to have to follow that one up with something really good. <laughs> I, won't, I won't insult him, but I'll, yeah. um, I'll insult Colin O'Rourke, because he probably insults everybody if he was here. Um, Ryan, I'm sure, knows that uh, he can thank Colin O'Rourke for a lot of his successes, because Colin O'Rourke famously declared, as he usually does, <coughs> that he knows everything, he declared that Throne would never win in All-Ireland with uh, players like Brian Doerr playing. So <coughs> that obviously came to pass. Um, I'm quite glad that I was retired before Brian came around because uh, he, he would definitely have done the sales of Duracell uh, batteries bad because he would outrun the Duracell bunny any day. So I think <laughs> I'm glad it was gone by that stage. <laughs> Is it true? Were you really the Victoria Beckham of Mead football flying in helicopters to training? For a while, yeah, for a while. Special treatment. And I'm not fond of flying, I tell you that. Uh, yeah. yeah. Noel Keaton was the was the uh, saver there. I was driving up for Fomoy and um, he said to me one day at the Cora, he said, uh, how are you getting up to train? And I said, I'm driving up. He said, oh, I bought an old helicopter there. I'll call down for you if you like. And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was in the car park and this thing was supposed to be picking me up at six o'clock and uh, I was there at six o'clock, five past six, ten past six. And I said, this is a joke. Someone's having fun at me. So the next thing, this dot appeared in the sky and uh, landed. And I think training was supposed to be half seven in Gorman's Sun. Um, we got into this thing, and we seemed to be moving about 30 miles an hour. And uh, I was thinking, so much point in me going up there if I'm going to be late. And I said to the pilot, I said, uh, what speed are we doing? He said, oh, 150 miles an hour. So I said, fair <laughs> enough, we'll probably get there. Uh, uh, yeah, Can we I, get a microphone? Get a microphone down to Brian Mullins there. He's sitting straight in front of me, so you're not going to be able to you're not going to be able to escape at all, Brian. I know you're blessed among vets here tonight, but as head of sport and a football man yourself, do you ever survive or get onto the wrong end of a cull by Sean Boylan? Um, I would never really have had a, any run-ins with Sean. Uh, Sean was a very mild-mannered individual. He was a. Uh, um, and were you? <laughs> well, he was uh, a, a bit of a contradiction uh, as a mead man. Uh, because there was very few of the mild and uh, mannered, although Kevin could fit that category all right. Quiet, quiet uh, they know. Um, the uh, conversation you're having with numerous individuals around the room is very apt. And uh, as Des has said, the, the importance of exercise and involvement in sport is um, very uh, appropriate to uh, particularly modern life. Um, I was fortunate enough that there was plenty of sports science around in the 70s and the 60s and I don't think the phenomena of fitness and sports science is necessarily a recent um, aspect to uh, GA games in particular. I, I always think there has been a, a very uh, worthwhile and uh, informative uh, involvement by GA authorities and GA managers going back to you know the, the 1920s and 30s. Uh, I know from my own family uh, on one side, having Kerry connections, that in in, in the 1930s uh, Kerry were having uh, squad tr training ongoing during during the summer of uh, uh, their championship seasons. And um, so like what Brian is trying to describe about the sense of family and the sense of group dynamic is, is very true. And uh, the team of tonight around vets who do a very important job, who do a very hard job, and it's a, a really a vocation as much as a profession, the, the team of being able to achieve in sport and also progress uh, a profession is, is very, very uh, laudable and very worthy of recognition. Uh, despite the uh, fun and games that different helicopters provided and whatnot, <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's a uniquely Irish thing that uh, sport has, uh, plays such an important part, not only in veterinary science, but across the other professions, law, medicine, 
uh, teaching, everything like that. So uh, I would like to uh, also hear and acknowledge the contribution to uh, that the other guests you have up on the stage, which uh, is, it's um, uh, interesting to hear the uh, perspective of, of the, the wide range of athletes that veterinary science has produced. Mm. Here, here. <laughs>